Hey Desiree, it's nice to join you on your actor spotlight show. Let's have some fun. <laughs> That's right. Let's have some fun. It's great to have you join me today. And I'm glad to be here. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> well, you are obviously doing some amazing things in film and you know, typically there's a story behind everything that people do in life, you know. So tell my listening audience, what made you decide to get involved in filmmaking in the first place? Well, I've always wanted to be in the entertainment industry uh, as a kid, uh, but actually what really uh, ignited the filmmaking in me was a movie called Cooley High, uh, directed by Michael Schultz, and uh, that's, that's what really got me going. It was a very powerful story. And it kind of made me think, and in some areas it made me cry. And I figured that if um, a media like this can have this much power, I want to be part of it. So that was one of the main reasons, or the reason why I'm a filmmaker today. Wow. I mean, and I guess it just sparked something in you internally that kind of motivated you to want to know more and um, get yourself involved, right? Correct. And also, right. like everyone else, I wanted to be – somebody and being being uh, either an actor or director or writer was being somebody at that time and uh, so it was very important for me to be better than you know what I thought I was so the entertainment industry put me in a light that uh, I'm coming from Detroit so a lot of people in the area at the time were, weren't in Hollywood so it put a light on me so that's what was one of the exciting, exciting things for me to be part of the filmmaking uh, community. Yeah, I can imagine so, you know, coming from Detroit and being able to travel. Cause you traveled everywhere. You've been in, you know, Los Angeles. You've been all over the world. So I'm sure you see a lot of differences from, you know, where you grew up um, right. based on, you know, where um, you've been. That's absolutely true. Yeah, I've been to Spain, to Holland, and France, Paris. I've, I've been around quite a bit, so I, yeah. I kind of know the area, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you've been, like I said, you've been at this for a while. You, you're you very, um, you know, well-versed in what you're doing, and you're, you're a master at your craft. And you have five films, I believe, under your belt now. And right now you have a film called A Day of Trouble that is centered around two rival gangs, namely the Bloods and the Crips. Yeah. And it involves characters who are cousins, but they're each in a different gang. So tell us a little bit about the film, and why it's important for you to bring um, this out? Well, actually, I uh, I was raised uh, initially in Detroit, but my adult life was in Los Angeles. So I was around the gang culture in the early uh, 90s and the late uh, 80s as well. So I, I was kind of brought up around it, and I saw it from the beginning. Um, I shouldn't say the beginning, but right, the height of it when it, it was a lot of drive-by shootings and it was just, it was madness in, in California at that point, uh, Los Angeles, it was really uh, a challenging place to be uh, if you were, were in the gang. So uh, I thought it was important because I never could understand why I would kill someone that wears a blue hat and, and I have a blue, I have a red coat on, a red jacket. It just right. seems odd to me and we're the same color. And then I met people that had relatives that were in different gangs, and they, they didn't talk to each other. And I said, wait a minute, but that's your your mama's uh, a, a brother's son. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys at Thanksgiving, you arguing. And then when, in one instance, a young man told me that uh, when it was time to, uh, to wash dishes, if it, there was a red cup in there, he wouldn't touch it because he was a <laughs> crip. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know how ludicrous that sounds? So actually, uh, as years passed, uh, I had this burning desire to, to talk about uh, the Crips and the Bloods and uh, the gangs in Los Angeles. So I used that that experience from that young man to have a family member, uh, their they first cousins, and one is a Blood and one is a Crip. But one of them is out of the game and now is trying to get his life together. So he's constantly telling one, the other character, hey, listen, th this is not your family. I'm your family, you know, uh, um, uh, because a lot of times uh, the, those organizations or the or gangs are the, are the person's family. You know, uh, in a sense, they die for them, they'll form, eat for them, rob for them, and it becomes part of their culture and part of their life. It, it becomes more than a, a blood, a relative, uh, the, the gang culture does. So I wanted to kind of highlight that and show it without being preachy, but to kind of show some realism about it. And I actually had real uh, gang members on the set in the movie uh, to 
giving me guidance, and also they played small roles in the film. Someone oh. like they did in Training Day. They had real uh, gang members in, in that in that uh, film as well. Yeah, they did. They did, and um, and that's interesting what you're saying. How you know you can be a member of a family and have, you know, rival members in it and something so trivial as, you know, a color is defining and, you know, defining you and also dividing you at the same time. And I like what you said about that, how you looked at that and you thought, well, wow, you know, something needs to change with this. But you wanted to bring, you know, that kind of awareness, you know, to light. So thank you for sharing that. And and the other thing is, you know, we all know that gang violence is terrible, you know, but more importantly, gun violence on a whole has reached an all-time high. And, you know, we're we're all saddened in light of Nipsey Hussle's murder on March 31st. So how is the Day of Trouble bringing awareness to gun violence? Well, ironically, I I actually had to – I I bought an album about four four to five months ago, his his victory lap, and when I heard the song uh, uh, Grinding, uh, grinding all my life, you know, I had to, I, I really wanted it for my film, and, and this is uh, prior to anything, you know, negative happening to him, it was uh, his, his debut album in a sense, the uh, way it was, and I had to fight my producers to get the song in the movie, and we did, so we got the song in the opening credits of the movie, and um, because he was in the transformation in his life, uh, against the gang, the, the, the lead character is, is is in the same stance as he is. He's done with it, and now he's trying to promote to his cousin. He it's time to move on now and do something better with your life. And so, uh, ironically, his his real life is what this character that was written, you know, years before uh, Nipsey, you know, really got his fame, uh, is in this film. So it, it was almost like a a, a magical or, or spiritual thing. Uh, that I was led to uh, Nipsey Hussle's music uh, months before, you know, this thing has ha- has happened to him. So I didn't just jump on a bandwagon. I literally bought, went to Best Buy to buy a physical CD uh, six months ago, you know, and because uh, I wanted to look at the pictures inside. And, and you know, ironically, we had, uh, <laughs> this sounds kind of weird, but one of my uh, – former girlfriends was one of his girlfriends, so we had that connection. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, when I would play his CD, she was like, I see you jocking my ex, and I'm like, no, I'm not jocking your ex. I'm just digging what he's saying, and the music and his beats is, is hot, and he represents what I'm trying to portray in this movie, Los Angeles. I want a real Los Angeles feel to the film. Right. And uh, so then when he passed away, it like hit me like a brick. Like, oh, my God. Now, everybody kind of jumped on the bandwagon and, and mm-hmm. you know, and I, I I heard about the man years before, you know, he really blew up. So I'm actually uh, uh, dedicating uh, a day of trouble to Nipsey Hussle. I, I went to his uh, uh, memorial uh, site and uh, we did some, uh, we brought a crew and did some more shooting. And so now we're back in post production now because we're adding some of the uh, footage from uh, his, uh, the Marathon clothing store into the film, uh, as well as his, his song opening in the credits. And at the end, we're going to give him a memorial. A dedication uh, um, to the uh, movie uh, to uh, Nipsey Hussle uh, from a day of trouble because he advocated what we're, we're advocating in the film. But like I said, it's not a preachy film; it's, it's subliminal. We talk about the messages without beating you on the head, and it's a story about family and love, and you know, even even got uh, college uh, students in it, cheerleaders, and things like that. So it has a it has a, a twist to it. It's not sure you know, gang type movie where you're trying to figure out what's going on and killing and banging. No, it's it's really about an intellectual look into the inner world of a gang uh, member who recently just got out of jail and his cousin picks him up and, and before they know it, they're back in the same troubles again, both of them. You know? Right. So it's actually a day of trouble. It's an ongoing yeah, it's, thing. <laughs> it's actually a day of trouble. <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, and I like that you explain that, that whole um, – scenario you explain about how you were, you know, vibing to his music already and what he was, you know, saying and you had made it, you know, a point to to go get his music and to learn more about, you know, him and you wanted that real Los Angeles feel when it came to um to gangs and, you know, yeah. um unfortunately, you know, um somebody took his life and that goes back to what I was saying about the gun violence and the gang violence and things like that and how you know, your film, um, like you said, doesn't beat it people over the head, but it does give 
a message about how, um, you know, people really need to take a, a look at, you know, what they're doing in life and understand that there's more to life than just the color. There's more to um, someone's history than just, you know, where they come from. There's a whole bunch of um, things that surround your movie. So I like that you share that with everybody. Yeah, I'm very excited about it, uh, the film. Uh, I think this is it. I think timing is everything. And uh, uh, it's going to actually come out this year, and uh, the timing is impeccable for what's going on as far as awareness, that is. And right mm-hmm. now, uh, the distributors, uh, the meetings I've had now, the, the Bloods and Crips are actually now is more international because of this situation than ever before. But, you know, people like Chris Brown, uh, 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 Cardi B and all them rep uh, the Blood, uh, 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 you know, flags, so mm-hmm. it's been it's becoming more entertaining now, and that was something that that bothered me initially. That's why when I wrote the movie, I wanted to talk about that because now uh, a lot of the hip hop and the R and B want to be associated with one of the bands. They want to be either with a, a Blood or they want to be with a Crip. And at one point, uh, the Crips were the highlights because of Snoop Dogg and everything of that nature. But then all of a sudden, it flipped, and it started being more of the Blood with the Cardi B and the Chris Brown and Lil Wayne. You know, it, it, and everybody was ripping the blood. So I, I wanted it became more of an entertaining thing. But I wanted right. to show that hey, this is dangerous. It's not all about exactly entertaining. Yeah. Is is dangerous? Uh, uh, and and that was important. And that was one of the motivations of me making the film too. When I watched these hip hop artists and R and B artists claim these games, and I'm like, dude, you understand? You claiming something that's really going on in the street? Right. It's not like it's this not is a not game. a game. <laughs> it's not. Yeah, this is it's not, not a game. game. You know, and um, so that that was important to me as well. Yeah. 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 Well, this is not a game. It's part two for Day of Trouble, right? <laughs> I'm calling that forth for you because, yeah, I mean, you're thinking of something that's that's absolutely true. You know, kids, you know, teenagers growing up, they're, they're, you know, emulating or trying to emulate celebrities, people they see in music, and they're seeing this, that, and the other. And some of them have no idea of the impact and the deepness that's involved in gang activity. So I'm glad that you brought that up. So, I mean, Day of Trouble is premiering soon, though, right? Yeah, well, uh, right now we, we, we're pending uh, a premiere down in uh, the uh, American Black Film Festival. Uh, Jeff Friday uh, uh, has a, a film festival down in Miami, and I was one of his, his alumni. I, I premiered one of my first movies, Nikita Blues, down there. So I'm waiting on him to uh, give me a, a thumbs up. Hopefully that happens, and we can premiere it in Miami uh, uh, June 12th through the 16th. And uh, if, it, if it goes real, that's where we have the initial premiere. And otherwise, you catch it on Netflix and Amazon uh, before the end of the year by December. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. So what is one of the things that you want, aside from everything that you were saying about, you know, gangs and making sure people understand the the impact that they're having and the impact that Nipsey Hussle had on um, society and his message and how he was changing and things like that, what do you want the audience to get out of watching your film? What's the message? What's the underlying message you're trying to send? Well, well, first and foremost, the underlying message is, is love, it's family, uh, but also it 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 is is about the gang because it's important that you don't you don't love a symbol, and that's what the message I'm trying to get across. Don't fall in love with a symbol because that symbol can get you killed, uh, and that's one of the major messages I'm trying to get across in this film that. You know, uh, blood is thicker than water, and uh, sometimes uh, you know you can you can embrace this culture, and, and it's mm-hmm. not even of you. you know? Right, right. But you embrace it because it is 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 in now. You know, is is the new in. You know, you know, just like we do with with the retro shoes we wear, or, or the, you know, whatever uh, clothing comes out. So my message is really to uh, uh, love your family uh, first and foremost. And don't and fall in love with a symbol, uh, especially if, it, if it's connected to a negative connotation. And right. and and unfortunately, this is not me saying this, but the culture of of that of the uh, red and blue has been connected to a lot of deaths in Los Angeles. And I don't want anyone to forget about that. I know it's getting mm-hmm. commercial now. The white kids are wearing the uh, the, the blue and and and, and red flags uh, around their neck and on their arms and they and their back pockets and and sagging and. You know, but at the end of the day, it was a lot of young black men 
and children who uh, die uh, trying to rep those colors uh, for many years. Yeah. And now, uh, uh, you know, it's, and look, somebody just recently passed away that, uh, you know, that was part of that organization as well. So it's an ongoing thing that we have to be careful about. It It is. And, you know, you brought up a really good point about how, um, not to fall in love with a symbol and things because people don't really understand, you know, the ramifications of that for one. And two, you know, you need to love yourself first. But it reminds me a lot of um, I used to work in the school system, and I'll never forget I was, I was doing some um, observations, walking around looking at teachers and, and things like that. And I happened to notice a um, – a group of third graders walking to uh, the cafeteria, I believe it was. And I'll never forget, a couple of the boys were um, singing this song or this rap. I think it was for the love or the, for the love of the cocoa or something like that. And they were just going <laughs> at it. And I'm looking at them like these seven year old boys have no clue what they're really talking about. Like none. Right. And right. they are, you know, singing, I'm like, do you guys know how to spell your name right? Do you know how to do, you know, your your addition, subtraction? Because right now it's great that you can memorize verses to a song. But mm-hmm. really, I need parents to look at that. You know, what what are we teaching, you know, our kids at this impressionable age about with music and, and symbolism like you were saying? You know, do you really understand what you're doing, what you're saying? And if people really did understand that, I think there'll be a lot of, of, of differences in opinions. And and if they knew the history of it, and that's what I right. wonder, but there's been a lot of death connected with the history of the red and the blue. It's, it's an, I mean, Snoop Dogg did a little parody of, of him coming out of a grave one time that got over like 30 million hits on uh, Instagram. He literally had his clip outfit on, and he was in the grave as different gang members were falling in the grave with him. That is just crazy. It's it just a, crazy. It was a pun. I was so powerful uh, for me to see that, and that ignited me to write the Selmas too, because I, obviously I've met Snoop and you know we chilled together, and so uh, the mindset uh, of he's changed. He understands right. that. Uh, right. So I want. I, I just wanted to add on to that. That you know it's important that you know where this comes from and what has happened by repping those those colors. I, mm-hmm. I just want that to be known that I know it's commercial now, uh, just like the N word is. But be careful. Right. What's the origin of these things? That's right. <laughs> yes, that's right. What's the that's right, Mark. The What's the origin of these that's things? That's right. And once you know that, then you can kind of change your mindset of, wow, am, am I actually speaking this on my life? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You are. It's a subliminal right. matter. It's subconsciously you can be putting danger on your life based that's upon right. what you accept in your life. You can you can you open it up doors. And then that's what I think a lot of younger people, and I think a lot of people are coming into this realization, just like, you know, Snoop or Nipsey. But as you get older, you know, I, I really i am a strong believer that, you know, maturity has, it doesn't have anything to do with age per se. However, once you know better, you're supposed to do better. And if you realize that a, a lifestyle that you're living or a way of life is not serving its purpose in your life anymore, then it's time to change it. And you really think about that in the big scheme of things, especially with different uh, cultural groups in America. Are colors really the biggest issue we need to deal with right now? Mm. That question needs to be asked because it's not. And that that's a good message to, to, um, to send for anybody who has um, had that as their focus because when it really comes down to things, you know, um, people killing each other over color, and when you look at it in those kind of terms, you got to ask yourself, is that what the focus really needs to be on? And, and you know, people have their own opinions about that, and I'm glad that you're bringing this um, movie out because people need to form their own opinions anyway. Right. And yeah, important. and that that is important. So what kind of advice – would you give someone who wants to break into to film, um, whether it's an actor or a producer or director? Well, unfortunately, is that's not a broad stroke. <laughs> so you, can't, <laughs> you can't give a. I can't give you a broad stroke answer for all of those. Those are all totally different fields within. Yes, they the are. Mm-hmm. And you know, so you have to be more specific about uh, being, you know, an actor or being a writer or being a director because they. 
all totally different on how to get in independent wear, uh, world or uh, in the Hollywood. So well, let's stick to let's stick mm-hmm. to acting then, because I know you. Okay. Um, that's part of what I'm going to ask you. You next. You work with tons of different actors, lots of yes. talent. So yes. if you were to be approached by an actor, an upcoming actor who wants to uh-huh. involve themselves in more films or actually uh-huh. just break into films, what kind of advice could you give them? Well, actually, uh, by me living in Los Angeles, I meet them all the time, and, and, and everybody say, "Oh, I, I'm an actor," and I'm and I say, "Well, where have you studied at?" I think it's very important to study and know your craft. There is a such thing as being a natural, okay? And I've met quite a few uh, individuals who were naturals, but but a lot of times you still need to hone your skills. And 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 I would say study. Take a, co- a college class at a community college if you don't you can't do that. Uh, pay for a class or uh, acting class. Um, work on some sets uh, as an extra, where you don't even speak, but you get to learn the culture of the set. Because a lot of times when I hire new uh, actors who happen to have a natural uh, ability, they don't know the process of the business. It's called show business. It's like, wait a minute, why am I shooting right now? Because, hey, it's, we're not ready for you. And they have to sit for five hours. And so there's a lot to be prepared on being an actor. It's not about you just showing on set and start filming. There's other individuals that have to get done shot before you. There's mm-hmm. lighting that has to be put up. And uh, there's studio films uh, with Hollywood where you actually come to set at 6 a.m. and you don't get to shoot until 10 p.m. So you're right. there for 12 hours sitting around. And sometimes you're there all day, you don't, get, you don't shoot until the next day. And that's happened right. to me on commercials and uh, major films and, and even to small independent films. So you have to know the culture and you have to walk into it knowing that, hey, this is something I really love and I really have passion for it, so I must be patient. Because a lot of times I get actors come on set and they, they catch an attitude. It's like, wait a minute. This is how the business is. It's called hurry up and wait. And, <laughs> once you, and a lot of a lot of uh, uh, young actors don't know that. It's like, right. no, it's, it's really hurry up and wait. It's not about you unless you're Denzel or, or Brad Pitt. It's not mm-hmm. about you. Mm-hmm. And so if you're dealing with other entities it, within uh, getting the, the props together and uh, all different type of things that goes on in, in the production. I would tell a person first learn the business as 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 uh, getting on the set as a PA or as an extra. All that things, all those things help you as an actor. People don't know that. That grooms you to have a gr- the right attitude because a bad attitude, even a good actor with a bad attitude, can lose them a future job. Right. And I've gotten a lot of people uh, stardom uh, because I put them a game of platform. Mm-hmm. And if they had bad attitudes when people, when other directors called me, I wouldn't. I would give them, uh, you know, bad reviews, and they wouldn't get hired again. So it's important that you come to the set with a great attitude. Understand that you're going to be sitting around for a long time. I mean, I, I got Brandon P. Jackson started, the guy who did uh, Tropic Thunder and the Percy Jackson uh, movies. I put him in his first film, uh, Brandon P. Jackson, uh, Essence Atkins. I put her in her first feature film. Who does all uh, was on the Wayne show with uh, Marlon? She does all the the, uh, the um, haunted movies with uh, Marlon Wayans. I put her in her first feature film. Uh, 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 so, you know, Kat, Katarina Graham. And I, I put her in a film called Forbidden Fruits, and, you know, she, she played uh, a Jada Pickett in, in the Tupac movie, and she also did the vampire uh, 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 film and Honey Too. So there's a lot of, a lot of actors that I put on because I have the, the ability to have a platform, mm-hmm. but – you have to come to the set with a good attitude so you can get your next position so you can get that million-dollar check like these people I just said did. They started off on an independent film with Mark Casey, and now they're making a million dollars on, on major Hollywood studio That's films right. because right. they dealt with the, the hurry up and wait on this level and then had to deal with the hurry up and wait on another level. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's two different tiers. It's two different tiers. You know, you brought up a good point about you know hurrying up and waiting because I think a lot – of people who want to involve themselves in entertainment have a misconception. They see the finished film and think, oh, wow, that's glamorous. I want to do this, I want to do that. But there's work, there's work, there's levels, there's things you have to do. You have to, you know, put your blood, sweat, and tears into things sometimes in order for them to come out and manifest themselves into what you see on the big screen. So I'm glad that you shared that. You know, it's not all, you know, flowers and candy all the time. Right. Right, yeah. yeah. The finished product is totally different than mixing the cake and putting the egg in, in the batter and the milk. <laughs> That's the, right. the final product is 
totally different. <laughs> oh, totally different. I mean, it's just it's like that with a lot of things. You know, you can take thousands of pictures and only one of them comes out looking yes. the way it should. You know what I mean? It's like that's yeah. the best one, and people like to focus on that one and be like, oh, that's so easy. I'm like, no, you don't know what it took to do all of this. So that's a great point that you brought up for upcoming um actors because that that's just the truth of it and you've seen it all. So in being that you work with a lot of talent, in the future, who do you have your your sights on to work with? Is there someone that you've been thinking about working with that you haven't um had a chance to work with yet? Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna work 'cause I I believe in the power of, of the, the tongue. Uh, Absolutely. I, I speak I speak it into the existence. That's that's my uh spiritual beliefs and uh Paula Patton, I've met her uh, a, a couple of times, and I've written some things. And, uh, and originally, I had a project for Michael B. Jordan, uh, which I did talk to, and he really wanted to work with Paula, but he got so famous that his schedule is not as ridiculous. So right now, uh, I'm, I'm is a young uh, brother by the name of Kofi. He's on, uh, I think, a Queen Sugar, I believe, mm-hmm. the Dark Skin Chocolate Brother. Uh, okay. I'm, I have a project called Chance Taken that I'm, I'm, I'm packaging for Paula Patton and him. Uh, it's, a, it's about a, a young man who falls in love with an older woman. She's about 15 years older than him, and and, and he's, he just graduated from college. So it, I wanted to show the love um, uh, between two individuals who are from different uh, cultures and mm-hmm. uh, age range, I said, uh, generations, that's what the word I was Right, for. right. And so that's, that's my desire right now is to work with Paula Patton. That, that's, she's in somebody that I always wanted to work with. Originally, yeah. uh, I, I, you know, uh, yeah, I would say her. Yeah, I, I think she's going to love that idea. I mean, the movie, the, the way you're describing it, I mean, I want to watch it right now. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's intriguing, you know, because everybody can relate to um, attraction. Everybody right. can relate to um, you know, liking something or someone or wanting to be closer or learn more about someone. And that's just one of those dynamics that we have with people being attracted and age is always a factor sometimes. Yeah. And um, that sounds great. Yeah, the sensibility of her, uh, I track a lot of actors, and I, and, and I won't even name the ones I track, but I track a lot of them, and, and their skill set is important to me. And mm-hmm. it's something about uh, Paula's skill set that, that's, that I think is really getting overlooked in a sense because right now the uh, Taraji P Henson is the hottest thing floating. She's in everything now, yeah. um, and uh, uh, sensibility is something that, in order for this character to, to, to evolve, it has to have a sense of a sensibility about it and, and, and a humbleness. And mm-hmm. I think she's that character, you know, like that. That's important to me, and yeah. I really can see this. Uh, as you can hear it in my voice, I'm excited about it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can uh, hear it because. Uh, this, 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 that was actually the first movie I wrote <laughs> years ago. It's just been sitting on the shelf. And Oliver Stone uh, once said, don't fall in love with one project. Make others and I always go back to that, you know. Right. And so mm-hmm. I'm taking his advice and, um, and went back to that first one, and now I'm ready to push it and, and get it going. That sounds amazing. And, and as a producer and a director, and aside from what you just talked about and all the other things that you have going on. What else is in store for you um, this year? Well, uh, actually, I'm shooting two uh, feature films coming up this year. Uh, one, a dance movie in uh, Florida called Last Chance to Dance. And I'm shooting uh, a movie uh, called Squatters uh, in the fall uh, in uh, the Midwest as well, in, in the Midwest. Um, so those are two feature films that I'm shooting. And I'm also uh, in a position to uh, set up a, a a, a sitcom, a television sitcom uh, that I'm creating, um, and also a TV series for Netflix um, okay. I'm working on also uh, about the uh, early days of uh, African Americans uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, I wanted to kind of oh, I love it. You know, get into that era of the 1920s and 30s of, mm-hmm. uh, of how we did the migration from Alabama. Mississippi and Georgia up to Chicago, uh, to Detroit, uh, to Cleveland, those places that wind up booming during that time. So now, this will be a, uh, a, a series? series? Yeah, like a mini series. Like, kind of like a modern day, a black, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, little House on the Prairie. No, it will be more <laughs> so like. <laughs> no, no. This, this, this is in a, in a city, meaning that 
they come from the south and they migrate. It was a great migration of the 20s and 30s and people moving up to the north to get jobs. Right, and, right. And that was a, that's a whole different uh, element that we don't really talk about. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I would say, I don't know if you remember, the HBO had a show called Empire Boardwalk, and it was about the 20s mm-hmm. uh, and, and a prohibition. So it's, 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 and that was the white version. So I would say it would be the African American version of of a, a boardwalk walk uh, empire that uh, HBO and Mark Wahlberg produced. Oh, that sounds like a great thing to to bring out, and I'm looking forward to that. So, um, what can people do, uh, Mark, if they want to get a hold of you? Well, I'm, I'm very, I should say easy, accessible, because I'm, you know, it's just, that's important to me. Like I said, mm-hmm. I met a young man the other day. Uh, his music was phenomenal, and, and I think everything happens for a reason, and he wants to be an actor, but obviously his music is phenomenal. I want to put some of his music in my film. Mm-hmm. Uh, Facebook, just look up my name. Uh, just Google my name. You can find me uh, if you go to M-A-R-C-C-A-Y-C-E. First name Mark, last name is Casey. You just Google that, all my info pops up, because uh, I'm on every every site. And uh, it's, it's, it's not that hard to find me if you're really looking for me. I'm not somebody that's hiding. That's right. We know who you are. <laughs> you know, and uh, I'm on Amazon and all that stuff. So if you just spell my name, you can find me. If, you know, M A R C is my first name. Last name is C A Y C E, Mark Casey. And all my stuff will pop up. And that sounds great. So, Mark, it was a pleasure talking with you. We are looking forward to seeing more of your film. Thank you so much for taking the time to share some of your story with me. I appreciate the, 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 the platform. It was great. Yeah, it was awesome.